up, go. It's an honor to uh, be introducing Sharon Bard today on my podcast. Uh, is it Sharon? Do I say it right? Sharon or is that how you Because it's spelled a little different than uh, the yes. normal Sharon. So yes. your mother must have been a uh, creative person. She must have been. <laughs> and you were telling me that your last name Bard is English and it means poet. Yes. A, a acronym for poet. Yes. And you, you are a poet. I, I'm a big fan of you on social media. I'm a big fan of you. I think, uh, I think what you're doing is amazing and it's basically uh, uh, keeping it real. And you, you started yes. out as a dental assistant. I did. And, and now you've been in this, anybody in our industry for three decades, uh, you, you pretty much learned everything and I can't wait for you to transfer, uh, your knowledge today. So, um, so basically, um, you, first of all, you just finished a new book that'll be out in June, successful conversations, successful practices. Yes. And you're legendary for taking average practices up to a million or two million year. So, so tell us what, what is this book? Tell, tell us about the book. The book is, here's a, a, just a little picture of it. This is one of the copies they sent me in the beginning. It's not a very hard to read book. And where it began was when I began in dentistry in 1982, Dr. Fran, I was hired by a wonderful 35, 40 year old dentist. And he told me that basically I'd be a janitor. <laughs> and I said, a janitor, because I had been a manager of the company I'd worked for before. And he said, no, you'll pick up everything the patient puts down and everything that I put down and cleaned it up. So not wanting to be a janitor, I began to try to study and, and learn things from other people like yourself, people that were in the industry, the different meetings that we went to, really studied everything I can to try to bring the patient into the practice and not have so much fear. So how come you don't have a Houston, Texas accent? Well, I've been told that I do. <laughs> <laughs> now I just heard a little piece of it there. It's so funny. I grew up in Kansas, and the weirdest thing I thought was the difference between a Kansas and an Oklahoma accent happens exactly at the state line. I and uh, I mean just exactly. And then my mom's brother moved to uh, uh, Texas, and he had seven kids, and the uh, the two kids under five instantly spoke Texan. And the, and the other seven uh, didn't. So I thought it was a very um, uh, interesting to me how the age really affect your accent. So, so, so basically being around 30 years, um, what, what, what do you think is the, the difference between um, the offices that are just getting by and struggling day to day versus the ones crushing it? Conversations. And, and you think that's more important than technology or whether or not you have a laser? Or... As important. It's as important. Because we make our relationships with the people that we're going to trust our lives with, whether it be a surgeon, our dentist, or our hairdresser. And those are the kind of people we want to know that care about us. And we want to talk to those people. They're usually the dental assistant, the front desk person, the treatment coordinator. Um, they are the ones who usually build a relationship initially, but it's very important to transfer that relationship to then the dentist. So that the dentist also doesn't walk in and ask the same questions. If you've ever been in a a doctor's office, most dental offices, they ask all the same questions on the phone that they do at the interview that the dentist asks when he walks in the door. So you've repeated it three times by the time you get to the big guy. And that's not necessary. It's important that your patients know that you listen and that you answer their questions that they actually came for. And I really enjoyed the podcast. I need to say this about Jason Olitsky's podcast. What he does is something we teach as well. Because showing a patient their teeth and giving them some kind of opportunity to have an opinion about what they want, not just what they need, I have found in my training that they will almost always choose more than we tell them that they need. It's true. I've done it before. I've dressed uh, like I'm dressed now when I go to an office, and I have actually walked in an office, sat down, met a patient that doesn't know me, that thinks I work there, it's a new patient and sold and collected $12,000 and the, the front desk person had not been trained. And she said, the, doc, the, the guy doesn't have any money. So no need to talk to him about that. And I asked the doctor's permission to have the patient come in with me and we collected the money that day, $12,000. And uh, I know you're a proper Southern Texas woman. I don't mean to offend you, but that's how the word assume came about. Assume means you're making an ass out of you and me. And to uh, look at someone when they walk in the dental office, and, and especially for me, because I'm from Kansas, and 
Um, all the 80 year old multimillionaires I knew, they all drove 30 year old Pontiacs. They all had, uh, you know, slacks on. I, I asked a lot of the older men, um, you know, um, they wouldn't wear blue jeans because back during the depression, a blue jean was an unemployed labor. And if you ever, if your ranch or your farm was, you know, if you ever made it big, you wouldn't wear a blue jean. And the, and you would have never guessed any of these guys had a dime and they had more cash than anybody know. In fact, of the t uh, only 10% of cars and homes are sold in cash, and that's basically the over 65 market. And uh, so, so, you know, we all know this in sports teams that, you know, all you got to do in the NFL is to get the best damn quarterback. I'm out here in Phoenix, Arizona, where we had an awesome quarterback, went 11 and 0. He got injured, and then we, it, was, it was over. And, and these dentists still will invest $150,000 in a 3D um, x-ray machine, CBCT, or $150,000 CIRAC machine, and they just skimp at the front desk, the assistant, and they, they, they almost look at them like they're just like unnecessary people that they'd love to, they'd, they'd love to buy a $150,000 R2-D2 droid uh, to replace their receptionist. I mean, they just don't get it that it's the, the relations. And, and, I, and I've always said that every consultant tells me that when you walk into an office, you can instantly tell if it's a million dollar practice. You just feel the energy, feel the karma, feel the conversations, and then all the other struggling dental offices, it's like some kind of weird library. And the lady up front's a librarian technician with a hiding behind a sliding door and asks you to fill out a chart. And I mean, you're just like, how, how? so, so what do you do? So you're a consultant, you're an in office consultant. Yeah. What, what do you, first of all, tell us this because <clears throat> with my podcast, you know, um, these dentists are driving down the road. They're all alone. So as a podcast interview, I'm, I'm trying to guess what this dentist driving to work is thinking. Most of them have an hour commute, whether it's in rural America or driving across the big city. Um, who is a candidate for a consulting like you? What, what, what problems is this dentist having in his stomach or her stomach or her gut? Um, what, what kind of problems are they having in their gut that you're a solution for? What, well, the first thing that I usually hear is I can't pay my payroll this month. So financial. Financial, and I print a treatment diagnosis report from their computer, depending on the software. And we find that they're they're not not diagnosing; it's just not getting closed. Okay, so you so and what? Um, well, first of all, what um, practice softwares? That that's a big question on dentistry on dental town. What what practice management for any softwares do you work with, and which ones do you like more than others? I work with Dentrix, I work with EagleSoft, I work with Softian. The one really? that I, yes, the okay. one that I worked on initially was Dentrix. And I love Dentrix. It's it's very user friendly. Uh, but I also my daughter is my associate. She goes with me. She had 17 years banking experience and she likes EagleSoft. Okay. And what okay, and Dentrix is owned by Henry Shine, EagleSoft is owned by Patterson, and yes. Softdent is owned by CareStream. Yes. Uh, and what what do you think of Softdent? I think soft dent's a little difficult, and most offices that have it have a harder transition hiring a front desk person, because I think Patterson and Henry Schein have infiltrated the field with software, which is a good thing. I don't yeah. think it's a bad thing. I think that all systems needed to change to be able to facilitate the treatment and the communication things that we have with patients these days. But for me to be all fair, on the message boards, it seems like the software that has the most raving fans is Open Dental. Have you noticed that on the message boards? I have. Well, have you? What have you worked with Open Dental? Have not. It's a small one. Okay. So, so then, so this dentist driving to work um, could call you, and you. The first thing you would do is, would you dial into their computer and print out the uh, the diagnose treatment, or, or how, how would that work? The very first thing I do is send an office interview that I ask the the team to send out to fill out individually. And they send that back to me. And one of the key questions. This is a written or typed or email it, or? No, well, it's typed and I email it. I have it on a Word document and I email it to the practice. They make co copies. I can fax it to them if they. Okay. And uh, they make copies. Each team member fills it out prior to my visit. And I get it back and I look and see what each team, team member really thinks about their doctor, their practice, and their changes. So how, what, many, how many questions is it? Ten. Ten? Do you know them off the top of your head? Uh, not off the top of my head, all of them. I will tell you the key question. I ask, are you going to retire from this practice? Well, one thing is, are you going to be in the practice? How long have you been in the position you're in? Do you plan on retiring? 
One of the most telling questions is, if this was your practice, what would you change first? And they'll tell you everything. And that's the assistant, the receptionist, the high. But by the way, what do you call it? I've noticed that you can call a dental assistant, a dental assistant, a hygienist, hygienist, and SNS, but man, it's an emotional subject calling someone. I'm, I'm afraid to even uh, type on dental town front desk or reception. I will say receptionist. Yes. I mean, um, what, what, what do you call them? Treatment coordinator. But what if you're not the treatment coordinator? What if you're the insurance coordinator? Or what if you're the I scheduling? Coordinators in my office. And let me tell you another question that is I asked. There, is there a generic term though that just refers to everybody working non-clinical up front? Yeah, the team. It's part of the team. I like for them to feel like a NASCAR team. And that everybody is available to do any position other than clean teeth and or throw enamel, enamel dust off the ceiling. You can't be the dentist. And you can't clean teeth unless you're licensed to do that. But when I physically left my practice after 20 years, our hygienist went to the front desk. She fit in perfectly. She's still there after 10 years. She's very happy. And what better person to answer your phone than a hygienist that's already been there? So, so it is true. One of the consultants' biggest secrets is they come in and they interview each one of the staff members. And they usually tell you everything that they think is wrong with the practice. And yes. basically, it's usually a function of, the dentist doesn't listen to their staff. Uh, they're, they're not humble. They don't, they're, dentists, physicians, and lawyers aren't humble. And the humble ones are the most successful. They listen to their customers, their patients, their staff. So, so basically, this dentist is going to pay. What, what is your fee to do consulting? My fee to do consulting is $3,000 a month. Okay, $3,000 a month. And do they sign up for a year plan? Do not. Okay, so it's just no contract, just 3000 per month? The reason is I think the only one, I've worked for two different consultants in my lifetime, and I think the contracts are made for attorneys to break or take to court. And if my integrity doesn't supply the need of the doctor and the things that we're doing, because I've had some clients four years, and I've had some clients up to 12 months, it depends on the level that they have when we go in. But I'm not going to argue a contract with someone if they think they're doing fine and they're ready to part as friends, we're fine. And so you're just a 3,000 months straight up. I, I, I like that. I like that a lot. So, so your first question, you, you said, um, are you going to retire this practice? How long have you been there? Um, so how long have you been there? Do you see practices suffering uh, more likely to have staff that hasn't been there very long with a high staff turnover? Or, or talk about that. Both. We have high, a staff that has been there for a longevity, say 10 years or more. Sometimes that's not always a positive thing because <laughs> we have a really strong team member that manages the practice. The other team members say, this is the first person I would want to get rid of if it was my practice. And they'll tell you why. They're just looking for somebody to really talk to. I tend to be the mother of the practice sometimes. I was in a DFW flying to an office in Oklahoma uh, a couple of years ago. And a lady, you know, you talk to people in the airport, one of the ladies in the airport, she asked me, she said, how many children do you have? And I said, 80. She said, 80 kids? And I said, yeah, all of my team members are my children. Because they'll call me in the afternoons, they'll call me, they'll email me, they'll send me messages to, to ask questions. And I try to be available for those unless I'm in another practice. But they, they need someone to really vent with that. An office manager, there's, I don't like the position of an office manager. Um, because she's a person with authority that can either fire them, get them fired, or give them a raise or not. And I prefer everybody work as a team and work decisions out as a team. So you don't like the office manager concept? I do not. That, that is very, very interesting. So, so back, back to staff turnover. So what do you think is a health, healthy staff? If, if I just gave you a hypothetical practice that was average, how many team members would be in and just the average 50th percentile middle-of-the-road practice and how long would the um, average team member have been there? That way, the, that way, this individual driving right now listening to you on a podcast could know if he has high staff turnover or, or not. Right. In my, in my practice, everyone now has been there 10 years or more. I still call it my practice because I helped my doctor build it. So they've been there 10 years or more, and there's four of them. Okay. And what do you think that average? Practice. Okay. So, so your practice, the average person with their 10 years or more, and there's four people and, and a dentist. So that'd be what? One receptionist, one hygienist, two assistants, and a dentist? One assistant, one hygienist, which is also the front desk, and two hygienists. Okay. And, Very cross trained, also. <laughs> and what do you think the average turnover is for the average practice in America? How, how long do you think the average employee in a dental office has been there? Right now, about five to seven years. <laughs> 
five to seven seven years for the for the assistant and or receptionist and a little bit more for the hygienist because most hygienists are able to drive you know they're pretty much in a little closed area it's almost like their own little business like a hairdresser and they have such strong relationships that the doctor will usually keep anybody there as long as they can because the hygienist is really a good partner for the practice I mean I think that they're very good producers I think well trained that they can equal or make as much money or more than the doctor does in production I've had smaller practices do that and I have doc, you know, hygienists making two thousand twenty five hundred dollars a day each. They're they're gross. Or are you talking about what the hygienist makes? The hygienist producing each. Producing two thousand to how much? Twenty five hundred. Two thousand twenty five hundred a day. That that's amazing. Um, and what do you say the average hygienist produces a day in America? Thousand dollars, maybe. Yeah, yeah thousand. I agree. And uh, and I also want to point out another red flag I've always seen when you go into an office where one staff member's been there twenty years and no one else stays there more than two. And the doctor just thinks that they can't live without that person. And that's the person running off all the staff. And that's your biggest nightmare. And it's always doctor's favorite. And it's like, okay, so your best friend in the office is the crazy one running off all the other staff members. So you don't like the office manager because you like to think of team. Go back to your questions, though. You, you, the first question was, are you going to retire here? Mm-hmm. Be, because you want them to say yes? You want them to I be? I want them to say yes. And that tells me if they're willing to learn or willing to change. Okay, so if I want to retire here, I gotta, I gotta be willing to learn, and I gotta be willing to change. And then, what was the next question? What would you, what would you change about this practice? If for your practice, if you own this practice, what would you change? And what do you usually hear? Oh my gosh, ninety percent of the time, it's the front desk. You're Many, hearing, you're hearing from the front desk, or you're hearing problems I'm about the front desk. The team, they want to change the front desk or the office manager, um, the doctor's daughter or daughter-in-law is that person sometimes and they want to change that position to someone new. That's the first thing they do is hire a new receptionist. So, so let's talk about nepotism though, um, mm-hmm. because it didn't really work in government when the King's children ran over when they died. You know, America is based on a meritocracy, but dentistry is still a family business. So, so I'm going to ask you the, 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 the 4,000 pound elephant in the room is um, doctor's wife. Is that uh, working a doctor's spouse? work in the the in the office with them the the dentist is doing the dentistry and their spouse is running the business that is that usually good or bad usually it's not good and why is it usually not good because they won't talk to the the really they won't talk to the wife for fear of having the wife tell the 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 dad of the practice because you guys are the dad uh something that they said and they don't have anyone to vent to they're afraid they're going to be overheard Many times the wife will go home and talk to the husband about it. Now they're both not happy. I want your I want your wife to either be at home or in a different business. I want you to complement each other's careers, not interfere. And I feel that, and I have seen practices where the spouses work well together, but that's maybe one in three. One in three. And what what do you think the ones that work well together? Because the one thing I, uh, but anyway, what what do you think the one in three that work well together? What do you think they're doing differently that the two and three working together are not doing well? In our office, uh, my doctor's wife came in two days a week. She went through the QuickBooks. She paid all the bills. And if we had any reservations to make to go to meetings, she took care of that. Uh, She was always gracious and kind. If there was any shopping, we did not make her go to the grocery store. She was not our maid. So if there were things that we just needed to do that she took care of, like helping us choose uniforms, helping us choose a photographer to help take pictures for the website, things like that. She was just very graceful in that position. But after she finished the bill, she didn't stay eight to five. One day she may be there two hours. The next day she may stay all day, but rarely was she there a full day. Yeah. And I want to tell doctors, a lot of doctors bring in their, their spouse because they think that's going to uh, prevent embezzlement. And, you know, might as well have someone on your, on your own team, your loving um, spouse, but a huge embezzler is always the spouse who's planning on divorcing you. And I can't tell you how many dentists, by the time their wife finally filed or they finally decided to pull the plug, there was six digits of money already moved out. Some of them are so damn smart, they've moved it to Sydney. They've moved it out of the country. And I know a dentist whose whose wife hated him so much that she stayed married to him for about five years longer than she did because she was sending five to six to 7,000 a month to an (laughs) offshore bank account. She had to make sure she was secure. <laughs> oh, my God. And then when she got divorced, she still got half of everything. And uh, it was just, I mean, can of word. But anyway, uh, okay, so um, 
What, what other questions are you asking on your consulting firm? Well, question. I'm asking the team members, is there a specific thing that you're doing that's not working? And what I find, this is what I find, and I know you know this. You've been here long, um, not as long as I have probably because you're not as old as I am. But you've been here long enough to know that if you have someone quit or retire or a death in the family and, you know, military wives or whatever, and someone moves away quickly, most, and I take Dave Ramsey, I'm a big Dave Ramsey fan. So most people walk in the door with a breath that has two hands that both function. They will be your assistant, your front desk. You can't hire them as a hygienist unless they are a hygienist. But they hire too quickly and train too slowly. That's one of the things, too, is someone, well, we hired Mary from Dr. So-and-so's office, and she's bringing all of her systems here. And that's not how we do things. And now you have a really big team confusion about who does what where. There's not any specific what I call who feeds the dog. Because if the person who leaves is the one who did the ordering or the person who leaves is the one who followed up on treatment plans or the person who leaves is the one who helped with Mark and they leave, who's going to feed the dog? And if somebody doesn't feed the dog, the dog's going to starve. And usually the new girl's not the one that feeds the dog. So um, the systems that happen, we just hire people that walk in because we're a very, usually a very tightly knit practice that we're trying to keep our overhead low and our production high, and we can't afford to be without someone a month or two, and we are just very guilty of hiring the wrong person too quickly. Well, I love the axiom, um, hire slow, fire fast. And, um, you know, it's again, back to sports. I mean, these sports teams have half a dozen people who all they do is scout every kid in college. Yes. And, and when they're looking for a quarterback, they know a hundred percent list of every single quarterback that's even could do the job. And they know everything about this. And Dennis just hire people off the street. They do. And then they, and then you're saying they, they, they hire fast and train slow. Yeah. And, and I, I would say the last three hires I've had, I'd say the average interview is 35 people. And when you're, when you're, you know, I'm 52, but you know, and when I was 24, that, that would, you wouldn't have done that. You know, someone would have came in, you would have had fun with them and you liked each other and, and you hired them. And it's like, oh my God. So yeah, so what, so what, so let, let's go there. I'm not, I don't want to deviate off on the wrong track, but um, what advice would you give to these young kids who've only been out of school 10 years or less uh, HR uh, for an interview? How, how do they, how, how, what advice could you give them on how to decide amongst seven candidates for a dental assistant or receptionist or a hygienist who you would hire? I know that it costs a lot of money and sometimes it costs your time, but I think it's very important to do a background check. Really, really important to do a background so, check. And by background check, you mean a friend request on Facebook? No, <laughs> <laughs> but you can look at their Facebook. Sometimes they're pretty telling. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're very telling. We, you know, we've seen everything from a pole dancer to things I don't want to talk about. And so they really do need to be uh, checked out as far as that. I think that you should call at least two of the referrals. Let's say that someone applies in someone's office and said, well, we work for Howard Coran. Oh my gosh, you work for Howard, where you must have been a really good blah, blah, blah. And they won't do a background check. And I've seen people make big mistakes more times than once, not calling references. So you recommend calling at least two references. Yes. And doing a background check. And I want to tell the, uh, the young kids um, um, that, uh, you know, the 30 and under crowd, the difference between our generation is, um, back when we were, uh, when I got out of school at 24, divorces were all fault divorces. So all the, um, uh, private detectives were trying to catch you, you know, with your girlfriend or something like that. And all these states got sick of all the gossip and crap. So they started going to no fault divorce saying, we, we don't really care the drama. You two want to get divorced. It's no fault. We, we don't care about why you're just getting divorced. Let's go. And that basically unemployed all the work of the private detectives. So they all reinvented themselves and went into the background business check. And I talked to uh, embezzling uh, consultants in dentistry, and they say this dentist hired a receptionist who was arrested for this in, in Florida. And five years before that, she's arrested in Kentucky. And how do you hire someone who's been arrested twice and gone to jail once for embezzling? We did it. We Tell did, that story. We hired a front desk person who had been a patient for two years. She was the, uh, actually, actually the receptionist for the attorney for the office. 
but she was wanting to leave because of the hours and she we only worked 10 days a month and she really wanted that flexibility she had a teenage son and she came to work for us we trusted her explicitly she could type faster than anybody i've ever seen in my life we swore she was going to burn up all our computers and she was wonderful she was very very pretty she was wonderful with the patients and uh, I was a professional fisherman at the time as well as working in the office and I had gone to the bank across the street and cashed a check for two hundred dollars and when I came back I just set my purse where everybody sets their purses on the counter doctors included and when I got to the gas station that afternoon to purchase my fuel before I left I was forty dollars short so I called the bank and said one of your tellers is going to be off this afternoon because they should have forty dollars of my money and they called me the next week and said, no, that wasn't it. So I told my doctor that I was missing $40. Well, he had been traveling quite a bit. He teaches out at LVI. His wallet had been laying there the whole time. And there was money missing out of his wallet, but he thought he gambled more. He paid tips more at the you know, restaurants or in the cabs or whatever. And called her up on a Sunday, and she admitted that she had embezzled from the office. And taking money out of our purses that we weren't even aware. Does your doctor... This doctor at TCLVI, you still work in that practice? I was in that practice at that time. I worked for him for 20 years. Well, wow. does, does he still teach at LVI? Mm -hmm. How's LVI going? Uh, as far as I know, good. Really? It's all doing good? Because yeah. I, I know that was a, uh, a big, um, the cosmetic revolution was like 80 to 2000. But it seemed like when the first uh, NASDAQ bubble internet economy popped, so did a lot of the cosmetic industry and the cosmetic oh, stuff. A lot of the structure. Used to, I think you could go out and sign up for any class. And now they have structures where you have to take all seven cores. You can't, you can retake one, but you can't take it out of order. And so, you know, they, they, and they kind of have a test. They didn't used to have a test. But you can now have to have, take a test, a written uh, test, before you pass and get your fellowship or whatever. So they've changed some things. But I've not been out there in 10 years, so I can't say everything they've changed. Okay, what other questions are you asking? Um, one of the things that we have to be very careful about, and, and I'm sure you know why, is tell us about your family. And I usually say, tell us about your family, not are you married? Because you're not supposed to be able to ask, are you married? And I'll just say, tell us about your family. You know, do, you, do they live here? Is it, you know, um, ask them about their children, what schools. And it's more on a relationship conversation. Do your kids go to the same school mine do? Do they need a college? Do they need a sports event? Do they need a new coach? And we talk about that in the interview with the employee to find out. And you can find out some really weird things by asking that question. Tell us about your family. So, so you hire, you do a background check. Now, is this an online service? Is it, I mean, do you actually know a, a person or a firm or agency? or, or what, how, do you, how do you specifically do that? Yes, you hire a firm. And there's different firms locally in all communities. And there's national firms, and they basically will give you a background check as far as do they have DWIs, have they ever been in jail, are they a felon, things like that. And do you use one nationally, or do you use a local one in Houston? Different people use different ones. We had one in Houston. So you just recommend they go to Google and, and search a background check online. And how much does something like that usually cost? Well, it can cost by the year. If you're going to do it by the year, if somebody doesn't have very high turnover, they can pay individually. Uh, do you know what the uh, ballpark for individual uh, or year? Um, for me to know that I really don't know how much it would be okay. now. So what? So um, what? What? So this dentist driving to work wanting to know what? What other questions is on this uh, ten question? I want to know what their accounts receivable is. I want to know what their production is. Obviously, those are the numbers of the practice. I want to know is there anything specific that they want to learn? I want to know if they read books. You know, ninety nine point nine percent of your team members never read a book. Many of the dentists don't either. Which I want to say to you about your book is because your, your new book is going to be out in June, right? Yes. Uh, successful conversations, successful practice. I'll tell you what, you know, um, you know I've read a thousand books and I, my, my library is full of books, but that, that's a rare behavior. And I think books are coming back now because of the, uh, when the computer jumped into the phone yes. and made it a smartphone and they came out audio books. Um, it's very hard for a monkey to sit in a chair and read black and white, but to put in an audio book while you're cleaning the house and cleaning out your garage and washing your car and on the treadmill, they, they love it. And um, <coughs> Dental Town is launching on, on, our, on our Dental Town app, which has now over 50,000 downloads. We're launching an audio book feature in about a month. 
So yeah. if that's something uh, you want to um, grace our audio book, if you, if you want to read that in a sound booth and do your audio book, um, um, and whether you charge for that or whatever, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Um, that might be, that might be, uh, uh, that, that, that'd be amazing. But I want, I want to go back to your question when you said that, when I said, this dentist driving to work, um, what is the big red flag that means it, it, it's time to call you and get some help? And you said, basically it, it was financial. It was, it was, they're not going to make payroll. And you said that they, you know, they, they're producing the dentistry. They're not closing. So I want to, I want to focus in on that. What is a healthy, I mean, how many dollars of dentistry need to be treatment planned for one dollar to produce? I mean, should they be producing closing one dollar out of every one, one dollar out of every two, three, four, five? What what what's healthy? What's not? This it depends on goals, and that's the first thing we do when we come live to an office. We set goals for the practice. I go back to last year's production, and I raise their production by twenty five percent. That's just an average rule of thumb. A goal is something to shoot at. It's like a target. It's not a hire or fire number, but we want to shoot at that target. And we set their goals first. And then we really try to help them reach those goals. And we tell the doctor, if your goal is 10,000 a day, you've got to diagnose 20. So two to one, two to one. Two to one. And 50% of the treatment that's diagnosed needs to be scheduled. Okay, so, so if you want to do a dollar to the dentistry, you're going to have to diagnose two to schedule one. And if you and schedule it, you've got to collect it. And, and scheduled with financial arrangements guaranteed, which can be prepayment, which we recommend, or, um, you know, whichever they're going to do care credit, whatever funding that they're going to use is fine. But that needs to be guaranteed prior to scheduling the appointment. And um, Sharon, what is, um, a lot of dentists are thinking, well, my practice is bad and I don't need Sharon because it, it's not me. It's my, my, my economy. It, it, it's Obama. It, it's, they, they closed down the factory. They, they did. How, how much of doctor success and failure do you think is exogenous factors like the, their local economy versus endogenous factors, how they're running their business? I think it's how they're running their business almost 100%. Because if, they were, if they're aware of it, they know what to do about it. You know, I have a doctor right now that's 74 years old. He's still working. He has his practice for sale. He only hired me locally because I've known him for 20 years to come in, help him build his production up. He was back around 400000 and he's going to end this year at 700000 And he's 70 how old? 74. Yeah, man, I love that because, you know, ba basically uh, your retirement pension is only going to be, for every $50,000, you're going to need a million savings count. And I, I can't believe these dentists try to retire on a fixed income deal when if they just kept working. How, how many hours a week does this guy work? He's working four days a week, and, and he, he works from eight to five. Four days, eight to five, and how old? 74. 74. I mean, why can't every dentist who's 70 at least work Monday and Wednesday, eight to four? And, and, and how much do you think this dentist is going to make at 74 this year? I mean, I mean, yeah, how much do you think he's going to net? How much do you think he's going to take home? He's going to net about 300000 Okay, so 300000 Um. 300,000 divided by 0.05%, which if he had all his money in bonds, that's, he'd have to have $6 million in his retirement fund. And everything we know about this is that since he's still working, yeah. he still has cash flow. It, it adds to their longevity. It adds to their health. It adds to everything. And it just really, really, I think it's a red dangerous flag when you see these dentists posting on Dental Town. How can I retire by 50? It's like, well, that, that's a dysfunctional thought. Why, why do you want to retire by 50? I mean, these are humans. They have broken teeth. They're in pain. They have disease. You're a trained doctor. You're a social animal. You should want to go to your office and help fellow humans get out of disease and pain and discomfort and make them happy. Why, why do you want to quit that? So why don't you just fix what's wrong in your office? You know, like, like my, my favorite is a dentist on the street for me who said uh, he would rather be taken in the backyard and beat with a stick than do a root canal. I'm <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, they're called endodontist. Yes. Quit doing root canals. Stop do doing it. Yeah. Make your, make your environment happy uh, so that when you're 74, you can still earn the income of what it would cost you to have $6 million in your savings deal. Um, I, I want to ask you another story. Why do you always say that it begins with the first call? It begins with the first call. You can spend as much as you want to spend on marketing. And believe me, 
when before I visit an office, I look up their website and look all through their website so that I know the, the receptionist's first name. I know some of the hygienist's first name. I want to know who's answering the phone. And I'll do random calls to the office. And probably six out of ten, I would never send my family to. And why is that? Because of the way the phone is answered, the questions that are asked and not asked, and the person either puts you on hold and you stay there until you fall off or hang up, and you're just not the most important person in the room that day. So what, so what advice would you, uh, I, I love it when dentists come over to my practice from up the street, you know, or they're from, you know, they're literally a block away or a mile away or they're in town or whatever. And I say, hey, let's up. I'll put my phone on speaker call. I'm going to call your office. And every single time I call the office, hi, my name's Frank, and I, I just moved here from Kansas, and uh, my <laughs> dentist told me I needed four crowns, and I was just wondering, do you do crowns? Oh, uh, yes, we do. All righty, then. Thank you very much. You have a nice day. And they go, okay, you have a nice day. And they hang up. I'm like, God. They didn't even ask me my name, the phone number, and 50% of the time, it goes to voicemail, and the doctor's sitting there saying, why is it a voicemail? They, they don't go to lunch for another hour. Why, why is it going to voicemail? I'm like, well, dude, it's, it's Monday through Friday, 8 to 5, and I just called your office, and I went to voicemail. And, 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 and you want to go do more marketing. I mean, you're not even answering. Usually the dentist is the last to know. It's like the husband is the last to know in a divorce or whatever's going to happen. The dentist is the last to know. And most patients won't tell. They used to not tell, most patients. But you look at the reviews online these days, people are blowing up the Internet with reviews that say that. But 90% of the dentists that I talk to who have a bad review don't know they have a bad review. They never even look at it. Right. And do you think reviews are important? You're going to have a website. You're going to pay for marketing. Who's going to follow up on that? So what, so what do you do when a dentist um, hires you for $3,000 a month and you go to their website and they've got uh, – how many reviews does the average dentist website have and how many of them are good or bad? And what do you do to the bad, with the bad ones? Well, there's two things you can do with the bad ones. You can ask that it be removed if it's bad, bad. They won't remove it. But you ask all your current patients, you know, if you had a good experience, there's demand force, there's a solution reach, a lot of different companies out there that will take reviews for you. And uh, you can post those on there. You can ask your patients. It's not good to do it in the office, we found, because the IP address is the same. And they need to do it from their personal phone. We want them to check in on Facebook when they get to the office say something nice about the office or us giving them a cup of coffee or a bottle of water. And those are the things that really help the reviews fall off, but they literally have to fall off the bottom. And most of the offices, when I go in the very first time, I've already spoken what, with... What do you mean fall off the bottom? That you have so many reviews, the bad ones fall off the bottom? People won't go around that far and read it. Yeah. Is, is there a bottom? I mean, do, does a Google review hold every review or just like... I don't think they hold every review because they told us if you get five, because I've called for different doctors, if you get five, then the rest of them, they won't show because most people won't read anything that's not on the front page. Interesting. Interesting. So you're saying, so, so how important is a re online reviews, would you say? Very important. Yeah, and what percent of new patients you think read online reviews? More now than don't. If they're over 60 years old, most people won't. But the, new, the baby boomer generation, are, we're huge really on reviews right now because of travel, uh, timing, who's going to drive us, where are we going to go, when are we going to get there, and you don't want to have that bad experience, especially if new people move into their children's communities, um, you know, moving closer to the kids and stuff, or moving back where the kids are, and they want to look at that, and I'll tell you, at my age, I look at a review for every hotel, every restaurant, every doctor I've ever been to. Hmm, that's interesting. I, 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 I'm 52. I, I'm not into reviews. Um, but I notice that um, more and more people are talking about them all the time. And yeah. now, now I'm noticing that if you're ever with four or five people and you're talking about a restaurant, two of them or three of them are reading the reviews in, in the car. And, you're just, and, and I'm, I'm totally aware of that. Um, so, I, so, so I'm going to get back to specifics. I want to hold your feet down to the fire. Uh, this dentist is um, listening to you right now. And, and he's saying, okay, this is great. She pays $3,000 a month. I don't have a contract. Uh, the red flag was I'm having a hard time paying my bills. And then you said the problem is um, they're diagnosing the dentistry, but they're not closing it. Uh, so I call you. So what, what, what are you going to do? Well, I mean, what would your first step be? Are you going to, you're going to send a, an email to, to my staff 
And so my four staff get this and, and that back and then is the next date uh, a phone call with you, a Skype on go meeting, or do you want to meet me in the flesh and you want to fly down and see the office? What, what would you do next? I'd like to come to the office. I do like to come to the office, but if like coming to Phoenix, I'd love to come to your office. I like to see the atmosphere because some people say, and I've heard many consultants say, doesn't make any difference. It's four walls with dental people. That's not always true. I really disagree with that term. I've heard that said in many meetings, and I disagree with it. And I think the atmosphere of the patients, the atmosphere of the community that they're in, the traffic area, a lot of things really affect that first patient, new patient visit. And I sometimes want to just sit and watch that. I'll come and observe for half a day, not to sit there and coach and say, don't answer the phone like that. You shouldn't have said this. You shouldn't have said that. I don't come and critique. I just come and listen, and then I send an email report to the doctor of the things that usually I have seen or found or discovered, and that's when I look at the reports. So how are so? Um, but again, specifically, so he's diagnosing three dollars, and a dollar isn't getting scheduled and collected, and he's having a hard time paying his bills. So it's a financial red flag. How how do you how do you attack that? I mean, how, what do you start with? I mean, you can't. I mean, do you start that big problem with? with uh, critiquing how to answer the phone or is there, or I do listen to the what, phone. What, what's the difference? I, I guess I should say, what's the difference between the acute emergency consulting that you do to get this person paying his bills and not going bankrupt versus the, the long-term uh, chronic problems? The first thing we do is <clears throat> the invitation to the office. You know, for instance, when we started placing implants, we no longer just accepted a patient in the office because they had a tooth that they wanted pulled. You know, one of the questions we would ask is, have you thought about how you're going to replace that tooth? So we listen to the follow-up. There's not enough. The fortune is in the follow-up. They don't complete the conversation. They give you a yes or no answer. Uh, yes, we do pull teeth. And don't say anything else. They don't usually even ask for the appointment. So we want to make sure that the patients are being invited properly, that it's being scheduled in the production, that you're not famine or feast on your schedule to drive the doctor crazy that there are very skilled financial arrangements that the patient knows what the cost is and that they know what their appointment uh, recommendations are going to be, what, how long they're going to be there, what the cost is for the appointment, is there a follow-up appointment. We want them to know that and many times patients don't know that and that causes a no-show for the next appointment sometimes or if the patient comes in for a treatment plan and they're going to go home and talk to their husband, you know, how many times have you heard that? I need to go ask my husband. Well, what kind of things do you think your husband might ask you? Because we can help you with that. We can help you with the answers or ask him to please come in and we'll answer the questions for him. So one of the things, the most important thing is the phone call. The second thing is, are you really inviting the patient to the office? The other thing we do is look at their accounts receivable and how much treatment diagnosis they've had in the last 18 months. Because if you diagnosed it five years ago, either they've gone away or it's changed or something's happened there. And, um, and really, the, the front de almost always a uh, front desk person, I keep saying front desk because I call myself that, but the receptionist almost always doesn't have a lot of time to do follow-up treatment because they're dealing with people coming in and out. That means they need to be cross-trained. Our hygienist, even today, I was in their office yesterday just to stop in and say hello, and those hygienists check their own patients out. No need to, to bother the front desk person. If she's on the phone, if she's talking to insurance, I don't like for her to spend a lot of time calling insurance companies either. And one of the things I'll do with them is I'll say, when is the last check you received from the insurance company? Well, the mail ran about an hour ago. I got about 50 of them here and just hadn't had time to put them in. And I say, no, when is the last check you got from the insurance company? Uh, you mean personally? I've never gotten one. Well, you're working as an insurance secretary. So how long do you want to do that? And you can look on people's websites. I did just yesterday. There was a guy that has a person hired. I don't know what he's paying her, but he's not paying her 20000 a year. And she was listed as the insurance secretary, and he's paying her. So to me, that just doesn't make a lot of sense. So we try to get as much paid up front as we can or guaranteed money for the appointment. That way the doctor's not chasing the money or doing without the money. We look and see how much is over 90 days, and usually there's a lot over 90 days. So what is, what is a healthy amount over 30, 60, 90 days? Again, this debt is driving here and she's going to get to her uh, account receivables. She probably hasn't looked at it one time in a year. 
And what what would be a healthy range for over 30, 60, 90? Well, when I left my office, we were $69,000 in the black. Money that if something had happened to my doctor, I would have had to write checks for $69,000 to repay the prepaid dentistry. They used to say 90 days, but I don't believe that any longer. I think you have a, a better chance collecting the money when I call it their feet's in the dirt. Maybe that's a Texas term. But when their feet are in the dirt, you have a pretty good chance of collecting the money. After 30 days, you've got a 50% chance. After 60 days, you've got a 25% chance. And if it's in the 90 days and over, good luck with getting that. Yeah, and and and, and I, I have to say that, you know, a lot of dentists, you say, well, what, what bothers you the most about your practice? Uh, it's always going to be um, the complexity of staff and uh, really p just dealing with people. And I, I think that's and that, that's what any human would say in, in any business, family, you know, everything. I mean, people are the greatest thing about this life and people are the most complicated part of this life. So that, that's a given. But next would be overhead. And what I tell these dentists, I mean, I look at their overhead. I, I think one of the highest causes of overhead is if you only collect 95 cents of the dollar that, and you have two-thirds overhead, that means the, the $5 you didn't collect, you had to go back and pay $10 to do the root canal filling, crown, chair, maintenance, rent, mortgage, equipment, bill, that computer, insurance, labor, if I can you had, you had to pay $10 for every five you didn't collect. So every dollar you don't collect, you paid $2. And if you can just get the collection policy to be Production equals collection that, you know, you go to McDonald's, you tell the 16 year old, I want a Big Mac. The 16 year old says, then give me three bucks. And if you say, well, I don't have three bucks, they go, then freaking leave. Yeah, you're not going to. And, the, den and the, the dentist says, oh, we'll bill you. Here's the Big Mac. Eat it, chew it up, swallow it, leave, go home, and then we'll beg you for money when you're not hungry. Yes. I mean, it's pay to play. I yes. mean, it's just pay to play. And, and these dentists think that, you know, that the, um, to be new age and spiritual and and and, and uh, eco friendly, that you got to be compassionate and you're in pain and you got a broke tooth and you don't have any money. Let's just fix you up and we'll worry about the money later. And that's not the way the human condition works. It's also every lawyer that practices only on malpractice defense say, you know what the biggest danger is? The biggest danger is when someone owes you five grand because they're going to invent five thousand reasons to take you to the board and sue you. Because they don't want to look in the mirror and say, oh, I'm a deadbeat. I just got a, two root canals and a bridge, and I'm a deadbeat. I'm a loser. And they're going to say, no, 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 no. That was never right. It doesn't feel right. It's all you. And I'm going to call it the state board. Because they know if they, if they go to the state board or threaten to sue you, that most dentists are going to say, it's not worth it for me to cancel day and go fight you. So I'll just write it off. So, yeah, you got you to pay to play. You got to collect that money. And, yeah. but, but, but back to holding, um, giving this dentist, I, I want this dentist to be able to get to work and see a metrics. Um, if the average, the average job, what would you say the average office collects in the United States? What would you say the average, uh, collects? Um, would you say 450, 500? What would you say for, for the average 50th percentile? Let's go with 450. So divided by 12, that'd be what? 43, three, that'd be 37, 500. So let's say 40,000. If this dentist is producing, uh, $40,000 a month on average, what would be his over 30, 60, 90, so that dentist can look at his report and say, "Man, I, I'm 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 about average," or "Man, I'm I'm in trouble." Eighteen thousand or more. Oh, for thirty, sixty, and ninety for the the whole AR. So no, you're so I, you're so you're saying if you for if you collect fifty a month, your total account receivables should be half that. So you're saying all account receivables should be about a half of a month's production. Well, it should it it is in most office. I'm not saying it should be because I think it should be even. I think we should be at 99% collection. That's just how we ran our office. <coughs> That's how he still is today. I went in as a patient last week and had my teeth cleaned. And, and I've worked there for 20 years and I asked for my debit card when I left and charged me and then sent the insurance and my insurance check came, is coming to me eventually. So when you get your hair cut, well, you may not get your hair cut that often. Uh, <laughs> I, I, stopped, I stopped doing that about 25 years ago. You pay your hairdresser. You buy your groceries. They're not going to put them in the car for you unless you pay for those groceries. I know. I don't. I don't get it. I mean, I, 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 I can't think of anywhere I can go, in from here to Kathmandu, where I can take something without paying for it. And then all, and then these dentist colleagues of mine, they do it all the time. And yes. I also want to tell you something else about the human condition. I firmly believe. 
that the average dental office that I talk to and see um, is about 95% collection. And it, it's at one in 20 is 5%. And one in 20 earthlings are out there gaming the system. They're the ones that are got welfare and food stamps. They, they work for cash. They're always gaming the system. And it's part of their whole makeup. They never had any intention to pay. And then when you you sit there and you you put down these policies, 19 out of 20 people don't blink because they can't go anywhere else in society and get something for free. That's but it's right. that vocal minority 20% that keeps the doctor up at night and someone is complaining and 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 and, and they're trying to cut out the receptionist by going to you and saying, doctor, your receptionist said, you know, I told her I don't get paid till Friday. And, and then, so uh, most social animals are non-confrontational, whether apes, monkeys, dogs, has, has, okay, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So that one in 20 vocal minority never had an intention of paying you, totally gaming the system all throughout life. And furthermore, when they ever have gamed me, I always made sure it was going to end up on the record. I always turn over to to account to a, a collection agency. Um, oftentimes would even on a Friday or whatever, tell my uh, receptionist, go down to small claims court and file a court. I, because I just want this person to have a solid record. So that five years from now, when they're trying to get a house, they realize, oh, this is a shady character. Some people won't do that. Yeah. They just won't do it. And the reason they don't do it is, and I'm, I'm gonna test you on this a little bit. I don't know if any of your team can hear me. I want your hygienist to finish their patients this afternoon. If you accept insurance for payment, I don't know if you do or not, but if you do, your hygienist will release the patient, they will leave, and you'll eventually get your insurance check. That patient never knew what the cost of the cleaning was. Most hygienists just release the patient, let them go, insurance pays 100%, they never mention the fee. So now when you start to try to collect the fee up front, they think you're extremely high, but you're not because they never heard the fee in the beginning. You don't even have to raise your fees and they think you're too high. So when your hygienist releases, even if they have 100% uh, benefit through their insurance, two free cleanings a year, right? So if you have two free cleanings, who pays the hygienist? Are they free as well? No. Your hygienists get burnt out. What they say? Average of 20 years, a hygienist is ready to go mow somebody else's yard. They don't want to work or they don't want to work in your office or they don't want to do anything. They want to change careers because they don't feel the value either. I don't think the patients are trained to value the hygienist because they think they work free. And so when you start to quote fees, that's the hardest transition into fee for service is no one in the office has ever quoted a fee. You're, you hear people call the office and say, I'm not going to Dr. Fran, his crowns are too high. My last dentist, I only paid $330. No, that was their insurance part. But the patient doesn't know that. And we haven't trained them to say that. We have not trained our staff to say that. And, and all economists say the number one problem with um, all healthcare models, whether it's government nationalism or whatever the hell you call America's hybrid system between government, Medicaid at the state level, Medicare at the Fed, but that's only, you know, Medicaid states for poverty, Medicare national for over 65, private insurance in the middle, is that nobody, nobody knows the fees for anything they're getting. If, if you had just a small, whether it's totally nationalism, Canada, whatever, if you had the patient have to pay, say it was just 5% of everything, no matter what, then the whole country would know the fee of a bypass, a hip, an artificial knee. And we, we have a country now where 100% of my patients that come in that had an artificial hip, knee, heart, whatever. You say, by the way, how much was that bypass? Oh, I have no idea. No idea. So why would they shop between a hospital that charges 125,000 for a bypass versus 100, or what you can find in most markets, where if you drive to a mid-sized town an hour away, it's, it's you know, 25% less. So, yeah. uh, but you opened up a huge can of worms. Um, a lot of dentists are always thinking to myself, um, Sharon, what about my fees? Uh, should I raise my fees? Or do you only do that when the economy is booming? And most Americans, by the way, I want to tell you, psychologically, most Americans, like right now, the economy is adding 200,000 jobs a year we have five percent of this is a very healthy economy but i've noticed with americans they never think the economy is good unless it's a That's bubble true. economy like That's when the stock market is inflating and it's a bubble about to be popped from 93 to 2000 everybody thought oh the economy's good no that was a bubble and then when there's a real estate bubble going on where the price of houses double in five years and people like, oh that's a good economy no that's a bubble and we live in a world where when it's a totally functional, normal, healthy economy, like right now, and I'm looking at the deal, this is 
May 15, 2015, your economy is rocking hot. You're adding 200,000 jobs, you got 5% unemployment, and no American thinks the economy is good because there's no bubble going on. But a lot of dentists are driving to work and they're saying, well, Sharon, um, should I raise my, how do I know of my fees? Because wouldn't that be the easiest way to increase, the hardest way to increase my production would be doing more dentistry. Wouldn't the easiest way to raise my production 25% just raise all my fees? How does the dentist know if his fees are high or low or if she should raise them or leave them there or even reduce them? Well, sometimes we will do the shopper calls for the practice, depending on the practice. And we ask that they call five people minimum or their team members, not in the office, obviously, because of caller ID these days, everybody knows everyone, and ask what the local fees are. You know, my daughter has been famous for saying, I just moved to this community, I need two crowns. My other doctor told me I possibly might need a root canal, but I didn't have it done before I left. Could you tell me what those fees would be to come to your practice? And ask those questions, but try to sound a little bit smarter than, you know, don't sound like a consultant, but try to sound like a person who's truly concerned about their dental care and about their fees. And most of the time she's asked, the first question she's asked is, do you have insurance? Me, you mean when she asks the fee, they just return the questions, do you have insurance? Yes. Kind of meaning like, who cares, you have insurance? Yeah, they, well, she's like, well, you know, what if, you know, she'll eventually say, well, what if I were paying cash? But they'll ask that question and then they'll tell her the insurance part. Interesting. Not the fee. Interesting. And, and how often should a, uh, well, first of all, there's professional agencies that do that for all the grocery stores. I mean, you see people go to the grocery stores and they're just, and, and, and a lot of grocery store chains, as soon as they see that you're, you're in there scanning their prices, they kick you out. Other yeah. ones don't fight it, but it, it's a whole shadowy industry for, for uh, uh, grocery stores. It's, uh, I mean, there's, and the best ones at it are, you know, pushing a cart and entering this data. But how often should a dentist uh, call other dentists for their fees? Do you think, how often should they address their fees? Once a year? Yeah, I think once a year. And the reason is because we were so um, indoctrinated, I guess, in the end of December, we had two weeks off for Christmas. And in, during that two weeks, we would usually have a meeting in the office and we'd talk about our fees. And between that time, someone should have called to see what the area fees are. And if we want to increase our production and not work any more days, how much do our fees need to go up? And we adjusted our fees according. In this community, there's that are there are crowns, and this is the truth. We're in a Texas A&M uh, University is close to us, so we have a really big demographic of people, about a 25% attrition a year of locals, people moving in and moving out, going to school, graduating, starting school, things like that. And the lowest crown in this community is 700, and the highest is 1700. Now, what town is Texas A&M? That's College uh, Station, Texas. College We're Station, yeah. College Station, North of Houston. Yeah, I've been to College Station several times. Um, so, so um, what do you think of this strategy? One of my theories was, um, I, you know, I've never heard anyone come back from a specialist and uh, no, and no one's ever said to me, uh, wow, Dr. Fran, I went to the specialist and he charged a thousand dollars for an extraction and you only charge 800 or I went to the endodontist and he charges 1500 for a molar and you only charge 12. No one's ever paid me that compliment. So I started saying one of the easiest ways to do my fees, if I go to court, on a root canal, uh, the, I, I'm graded by the endodontist center. When, when people talk about peer review, well, your peers at the board are gonna be the specialists. You're, you're doing endo, it's gonna be endodontist. You're doing ortho, it's gonna be orthodontist. So if your endodontist is charging this much for a molar, and half the time she's in your medical dental practice anyway, so she's yeah. in your same zip code, and she makes a <coughs> full-time living doing root canals all day long every day for the last decade at this fee why don't you why don't you charge that fee you're going to be held to her level um the customers don't know the fees like like if i had to have my gallbladder removed i mean <laughs> if, if you if you told me a fee i mean what would i compare it to a can of campbell's mushroom soup at the store i mean a cheeseburger at mcdonald's i mean if you told me my gallbladder is five thousand i'd say okay if you said 7500 i'd say okay you told 12 i i don't know so what, what do you think about just setting your fees to what all the specialists in your zip code charge? Many of us do. Many of us do. And I'll tell you something else that's happened in our community. I don't know if it's happened in yours yet or if it will. We had a doctor that uh, began to do implants. The single, simple, you know, not really sinus lifts or anything yet, just doing simple implants. And then he sent a patient out to the oral surgeon to place an implant. And the oral surgeon sent the patient back with, guess what? 
a Sarat crown already on it. Wow. He looked in the mouth and he was like, uh, that's all right, did we? You know, he's asking his assistant, we already do that crown. Uh, nope, it's not in our record. We didn't do that crown. But the oral surgeon was kind of miffed because there's so many GPs doing implants now that he said they're going to do implants on the crowns. Interesting. And did Interesting. Happen. And there's an uh, orthodontist in uh, Arkansas who's all kinds of uh, trouble because he, he added hygiene. And he, he just said, you know, there's, you know, there's, my, my patients need cleanings. And, and, uh, and so he started adding hygienists. And it's kind of weird because it looks weird to the press when the board's trying to tell an orthodontist that he can't have hygienists doing cleanings. I mean, that, that, that's the public. Said. So it's extremely controversial. But I want to um, end on this. Um, um, we put up 307 one hour online C courses on Dental Town, and they've been viewed half a million times. I wish you would create an uh, a online C course that the, the whole dental office could sit around and watch, and you could educate them. And uh, would you ever be game for that? I would. And I do, I have a YouTube channel, and I have placed some things on YouTube talking about both about marketing and some what I do is, you know, you can always learn from somebody. I, I say that I'm a constant student. Well, you could, you could, you could email those uh, YouTube videos and, and that could be a framework and yes. then, then a voiceover, talk about them, have an organized manner. And, um, and, and also um, this dentist driving to work, he, uh, she just pulled up to work. Mm -hmm. uh, if she wanted to talk to you, do you, could she just call you or talk Absolutely. to you or, or what do you, or what do you recommend? Eat, what, what contact information are you willing to give on a podcast? On my website, dentalpracticebydesign.com. The upper right corner, there is a free 30 minute consultation and she can call me with numbers, questions, any particular problem. I will coach her on the phone as a compliment to her practice for 30 minutes free. You willing to give out your cell phone on the podcast or yeah. you, what, yeah. what, what, it's 979-255-2566. And what do they want to email you? It's Sharon, S-H-E-R-R-A-N at dentalpracticebydesign.com. So Sharon, S-H-E-R-R-A-N, I'm Irish. Isn't that the Irish version of Sharon? Is that it? So, so, so you're Irish? So if you're Irish and you said you used to be a professional fisherman, I take it your fishing bait is a bottle of Jameson whiskey and a stick of dynamite, <laughs> and you just drink and throw dynamite in the lake? Did, did, I, did I guess it right? That's pretty illegal. <laughs> what, how, what do you, what, how do you fish? What, what do you go after? Bass fishing. Lake, so lake? Yes. Lake bass fish. You got a bass boat? Yes. Oh my God, that's amazing. Well, Sharon, uh, first of all, seriously, I'm a big fan of yours. I have been for a long time. Uh, thank you so much for giving me an hour of your time. And thank you for all you do. Uh, you're all over social media. Uh, I, I just think you're an amazing person. And thank you so much for spending an hour with me uh, on a Friday afternoon. Well, thank you. And I want you to know this as well. And this is something that I've learned from you so many things looking at all the posts that you put i spread those everywhere because so many people don't see the things that you see when you're looking at a patient's mouth and when you post those photos and i post them you should see the oh my gods so we're educating people just with the photos that you send and the humor you put in it if you're not going to laugh your way through life you need to quit so you got to love what you're doing you got to keep what you're doing and retirement is it's just not an option for me you know, it's to the point that you learn one. Dr. Sheila Scheinberg taught me in, in the 70s. I attended a meeting of hers at the University of Houston, and she said, you learn one, do one, teach one, and it's my generation to start to teach. And that's why I wrote the book. That's why I made it affordable, easy for a team member, is because I want those team members, I want my family, your family, your grandchildren, to be asked what they want. You, yes, you've got to tell them what they need. But I want a relationship built so that they're long-term in your office and in your son's offices if they choose to be dentists or in someone's daughter's office. I want my family to be treated like I treated my patients. The only way to do that is teach it. And that book will be out next month, uh, Successful Conversations, Successful Practices. Yes. Yeah, that, that should be the name of your online CE course. <laughs> you, you should make an online CE course. Get your information, the book, the videos, whatever. And if you want to, do, uh, if you want to debut our audiobook deal, and like I say, you can sell it on there or make it free. It doesn't matter whatever your business model is. Some people like to put up for free so you get the maximum number of listens. Other people want to make revenue. But whatever you want to do, 
Uh, it was good to uh, spend an hour with my Irish sister, Sharon. And uh, thank you for all you do for dentistry. Thank you. Thank you, too. All right. Bye-bye. Have a wonderful afternoon. You, too.